An audio by Florence Earl Coates, read for LibriVox.org by Ananda Samudran. Sorrow, quit me for a while. Wintry days are over. Hope again, with April smile. Violets, sows, and clover. Pleasure follows in a path. Love itself flies after, and the brook, a music hath. Sweet as childhood's laughter, not a bird upon the bough can repress its rapture, not a bud that blossoms now, but doth beauty capture. Sorrow, thou art winter's mate. Spring cannot regret thee, yet, ah, oh, yet, my friend of late, I shall not forget thee. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Apparitions by Robert Browning Read for LibriVox.org by Roger Smith Apparitions Such a star bank of moss Till that may morn Blue ran to flash across Violets were born. Sky, what a scowl of cloud, Till, near and far, Ray on ray split the shroud, Splendid, a star. World, how it walled about, Life with disgrace, Till God's own smile came out, That was my face. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Blessed are the Peacemakers by G. K. Chesterton Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk Of old with a divided heart I saw my people's pride expand Since a man's soul is torn apart By Mother Earth and Fatherland I knew through many a tangled tale Glory and truth not one but two King Constable and Amarail took me like trumpets, but I knew a blacker thing than blood's own dye weighed down great Hawkins on the sea, and Nelson turned his blindest eye on Naples and on liberty. Therefore, to you, my thanks, O throne, O thousandfold and frozen folk, for whose cold frenzies all your own the battle of the rivers broke who have no faith a man could mourn nor freedom any man desires but in a new clean light of scorn close up my quarrel with my sires who bring my english heart to me who mend me like a broken toy till i can see you fight and flee and laugh as if i were a boy End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Court Historian by Walter Thornbury. Read for LibriVox.org by Ike Scher. Lower Empire, circa AD 700. The monk Arnulfus uncorked his ink that shone with a blood red light just now as the sun began to sink. His vellum was pumice to silvery white. The Basilius, for so he began, is a royal sagacious Mars of a man than the very lion Balder. He has married the stately widow of Thrace. Hush! cried a voice at his shoulder. His palate gleamed with a burnished green, bright as a dragonfly's skin. His gold leaf shone like the robe of a queen, his azure glowed as a cloud-worn thin, Deep as the blue of the king whale's lair. The porphyrogenitor Zoe the fair is about to wed with a prince much older, of an unpropitious mien, and look, hush, cried a voice at his shoulder. The red flowers trellised the parchment page. The birds leaped up on the spray. The yellow fruit swayed and drooped and swung. It was autumn mixed up with May. Oh, but his cheek was shriveled and shrunk. 
The child of the basilius, wrote the monk, is golden haired tender the queen's arms fold her. Her stepmother Zoe doth love her so. Hush, cried the voice at his shoulder. The kings and martyrs and saints and priests all gathered to guard the text. There was Daniel, snug in the lion's den, singing no whit perplexed, brazen Samson with spear and helm. The queen, wrote the monk, rules firm this realm, for the king gets older and older. The Norsemen Torkil is brave and fair. Hush, cried a voice at his shoulder. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Crusader Returns from Captivity by G. K. Chesterton Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk I have come forth alive from the land of purple and poison and glamour, where the charm is strong as the torture, being chosen to change the mind. Torture of wordless dance and wineless feast without clamour, palace hidden in palace, garden with garden behind, women veiled in the sun or bare as brass in the shadows, and the endless eyeless patterns where each thing seems an eye and my stride is on caesar's sand where it slides to the english meadows to the last low woods of sussex and the road that goes to rye in the cool and careless woods the eyes of the eunuchs burnt not but the wild hawk went before me being free to return or roam the hills had broad unconscious backs and the treetops turned not and the huts were heedless of me and i knew i was at home and i saw my lady afar and her holy freedom upon her a head without veil averted and not to be turned with charms and I heard above bannerets blown the intolerant trumpets of honor that usher with iron laughter the coming of Christian arms. My shield hangs stainless still, but I shall not go where they praise it. A sword is still at my side, but I shall not ride with the king. Only to walk and to walk and to stun my soul and amaze it, a day with the stone and the sparrow, and every marvellous thing. I have trod the curves of the crescent, in the maze of them that adore it, curved around doorless chambers, and unbeholden abodes. But I walk in the maze no more, on the sign of the cross I swore it, the wild white cross of freedom, the sign of the white crossroads. And the land shall leave me or take, and the woman take me or leave me. There shall be no more night or nightmare seen in a glass, but life shall hold me alive, and death shall never deceive me. As long as I walk in England, in the lanes that let me pass. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Dark House by Edward Arlington Robinson. Read for LibriVox.org by Ronald Gardella. Where a faint light shines alone, dwells the demon I have known. Most of you had better say, the dark house and go your way do not wonder if i stay for i know the demon's eyes and their lore that never dies banish all your fond alarms for i know the foiling charms of her eyes and of her arms and i know that in one room burns a lamp as in a tomb and i see the shadow glide back and forth of one denied power to find himself outside there he is who is my friend damned he fancies to the end vanquished ever since the door closed he thought forevermore on the life that was before 
and the friend who knows him best sees him as he sees the rest who are striving to be wise while a demon's arms and eyes hold them as a web would flies all the words of all the world aimed together and then hurled would be stiller in his ears than a closing of still shears on a thread made out of years but there lives another sound more compelling more profound there's a music so it seems that assuages and redeems more than reason more than dreams there's a music yet unheard by the creature of the word though it matters little more than a wave wash on a shore till a demon shuts a door so if he be very still with his demon and one will murmurs of it may be blown to my friend who is alone in a room that i have known after that from everywhere seeing life will find him there then the door will open wide and my friend again outside will be living having died end of poem this recording is in the public domain dead poet by josephine pinckney read for LibriVox.org by newgate novelist we thought of him as filling an armchair exclusively in the plane of commonplace we saw him as light eyebrows sandy hair and a rather eager beaming type of face we never doubted that his spirit stayed comfortably at home in his brown suit nor dreamed that it could stumblingly have strayed painfully seeking life's dark buried root he had too much good nature for a poet too much of easy means to our thinking if he had suffered there was nothing to show it in the shy eyes that our askance set blinking so when his metaphors began to climb and dream on heights we said it was pedantic for him to utter cryptic things in rhyme and smiled at him grown suddenly romantic and when he said the gibbous moon's a dream worn in the sky of time we noticed that he now took lemon at tea instead of cream for the not unfounded fear of getting fat till in the presence of his shielded eyes death's dignity had shamed our common sense and we confessed his right to being wise who now held knowledge of our going hence end of poem this recording is in the public domain the dream bridge by clark ashton smith read for LibriVox.org by stunning in august 2023 All drear and barren seemed the hours That past rain swept and tempest blown. The dead leaves fell like brownish notes Within the rain's gray monotone. There came a lapse between the showers. The clouds grew rich with sunset gleams. Then o'er the sky a rainbow sprang, A bridge unto the land of dreams. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Epode by Ben Johnson. Read for LibriVox.org by Public Domain Scholar. Epode. Not to know vice at all and keep true state is virtue and not fate. Next to that virtue is to know vice well and her black spite expel which to effect since no breast is so sure or safe but she'll procure some way of entrance we must plant a guard of thoughts to watch and ward at the eye and ear the ports unto the mind that no strange or unkind object arrive there but the heart our spy give knowledge instantly to wakeful reason our affections king who in the examining will quickly taste the treason and commit close the close cause of it tis the securest policy we have to make our sense our slave but this true course is not embraced by many by many scarce by any for either our affections do rebel or else the sentinel 
that should ring larum to the heart doth sleep, or some great thought doth keep back the intelligence, and falsely swears they are base and idle fears, whereof the loyal conscience so complains, thus by these sought out trains do several passions invade the mind, and strike our reason blind, of which usurping rank some have thought love the first as prone to move most frequent tumults, horrors, and unrests in our inflamed breasts. But this doth from the cloud of error grow, which thus we overblow. The thing they here call love is blind desire, armed with bow, shafts, and fire, inconstant like the sea, of whence tis born, rough swelling, like a storm, with whom who sails rides on the surge of fear, and boils as if he were in a continual tempest. Now true love no such effects doth prove, that is an essence far more gentle fine, pure, perfect, nay divine. It is a gold chain let down from heaven, whose links are bright and even, that falls like sleep on lovers, and combines the soft and sweetest minds in equal knots. This bears no brands nor darts to murder different arts, but in a calm and godlike unity preserves community. Oh, who is he that in this peace enjoys the elixir of all joys, a form more fresh than are the Eden bowers, and lasting as her flowers, richer than time, and as time's virtue rare, sober as sightest care, a fixed thought, a nigh untaught the glance, who blessed with such high chance, would at suggestion of a steep desire, cast himself from the spire of all his happiness, but soft I hear, some vicious fool draw near, that cries we dream, and swears there's no such thing, as this chaste love we sing, peace, luxury, Thou art like one of those who, being at sea, suppose, because they move, the continent thought so. No, vice, we let thee know, though thy wild thoughts with sparrow wings do fly, turtles can chastely die, and yet, in this, to express ourselves more clear, we do not number here, such spirits as our only continent, because lust means are spent, or those who doubt the common mouth of fame, and for their place and name, cannot so safely sin, their chastity is mere necessity, nor mean we those whom vows and conscience have filled with abstinence. Though we acknowledge who can so abstain makes a most blessed gain. He that for love of goodness hateth ill is more cronworthy still than he which for sin's penalty forbears his heart sins, though he fears. But we propose a person like our dove, graced with a phoenix love, the beauty of that clear and sparkling light would make a day of night, and turn the blackest sorrows to bright joys, whose odorous breath destroys all taste of bitterness, and makes the air as sweet as she is fair, a body so harmoniously composed, as if nature disclosed all her best symmetry in that one feature, oh so divine a creature, who could be false to, chiefly, when he knows how only she bestows the wealthy treasure of her love on him making his fortune swim in the full flood of her admired perfection what savage brute affection would not be fearful to offend a dame of this excelling frame much more a noble and right generous mind to virtuous moods inclined that knows the weight of guilt he will refrain from thoughts of such a strain and to his sense object the sentence ever man may securely sin but safely never End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Evening, Whooping Island by Josephine Pinckney. Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist. There is a soft entrancement about evening about the warm earth steeped in childlike rest something that keys man's mood to simple passions and wakes an aching hunger in his breast the drowsy night things murmur in the grass to weary feet that feel a country lane and buried voices cry to them that pass an oak-hid cabin with an orange pane and like an ancient charcoal burner comes darkness and smudges with a broad black hand the hollows 
and with slow forefinger draws ditches and ruts and furrows on the land until the passing on the road is muffled to blind home-going wheels that grind the sand and horned owls hooting voices and old anguish for old lost things we scarcely understand end of poem this recording is in the public domain Excuse for Wishing Her Less Fair by Thomas Stanley Read for LibriVox.org by Public Domain Scholar Excuse for Wishing Her Less Fair Why thy passion should it move that I wish thy beauty less Fools desire what is above power of nature to express and to wish it had been more had been to outwish her store if the flames within thine eye did not too great heat inspire Men might languish, yet not die, at thy less ungentle fire, and might on thy weaker light gaze, and yet not lose their sight, nor wouldst thou less fair appear, for detraction adds to thee, if some parts less beauteous were, others would much fairer be, nor can any part we know best be styled when all are so. Thus this great excess of light, which now dazzles our weak eyes, would eclipse appear more bright, and the only way to rise, or to be more fair, for thee, Celia, is less fair to be. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Fate by R. K. Munkittrick Read for LibriVox.org by M. Lee once i planted some potatoes in my garden fair and bright unelated long i waited and no sprout appeared in sight but my peach blows in the cellar on the cold and grimy flag all serenely spotted greenly in an ancient paper bag end of poem this recording is in the public domain the final choice by edmund vance cook read for librivox dot org by m lee dark doubts between the promise and event young i rather thought that alexander would sound well at the font while mother much preferred leander for him who swam the hellespont grandfather clamored for uriah while grandma mentioned obadiah then mother spoke of clarence cyril and reginald and claude but i thought none of them were virile like some such name as ichabod grandfather spoke for jeremiah and grandma favored azariah then harold gerald donald luke and lordly roderick waged wordy war with marmaduke and bernard and theodoric while grandpa hinted zachariah and grandma thought of hezekiah we spoke of gottlieb from the german of gaius caius saul of andrew francois ivan herman of caspar jasper peter paul still grandpa stuck for nehemiah and grandma ventured jedediah from aaron down to zeph we went but fate is so contrary for after the august event the name we really chose was mary though grandma much preferred maria and grandpa rooted for sophia end of poem this recording is in the public domain Lamond by Edward Arlington Robinson, read for LibriVox.org by Ronald Gardella. The man Flamond from God knows where, with firm address and foreign air, with news of nations in his talk, and something royal in his walk, with glint of iron in his eyes, but never doubt nor yet surprise, 
appeared and stayed and held his head as one by kings accredited, erect with his alert repose about him and about his clothes. He pictured all tradition hears of what we owe to 50 years. His cleansing heritage of taste paraded neither want nor waste, and what he needed for his feet to live, he borrowed graciously. He never told us what he was or what mischance or other cause had banished him from better days to play the Prince of Castaways. Meanwhile, he played surpassing well, a part for most unplayable. In fine, one pauses half afraid to say for certain that he played, for that one may as well forego conviction as to yes or no. Nor can I say just how intense would then have been the difference to several who, having striven in vain to get what he was given, would see the stranger taken on by friends not easy to be won. Moreover, many a malcontent he soothed and found munificent, his courtesy beguiled and foiled, suspicion that his years were soiled, his mien distinguished any crowd, his credit strengthened what he bowed, and women, young and old, were fond of looking at the man Flamond. There was a woman in our town on whom the fashion was to frown, but while our talk renewed the tinge of a long, faded, scarlet fringe, the man Flamand saw none of that, and what he saw we wondered at, that none of us in her distress could hide or find our littleness. There was a boy that all agreed had shut within him the rare seed of learning. We could understand, but none of us could lift a hand. The man Flamand appraised the youth and told a few of us the truth, and thereby, for low gold, a flowered future was enrolled. There were two citizens who fought for years and years and over naught. They made life awkward for their friends and shortened their own dividends. The man Flamon said what was wrong should be made right, nor was it long before they were again in line and had each other in to dine. And these I mention are but four of many out of many more. So much for them, but what of him? So firm in every look and limb, what small satanic sort of kink was in his brain? What broken link withheld him from the destinies that came so near to being his? What was he when we came to sift his meaning and to note the drift of incommunicable ways that make us ponder while we praise? Why was it that his charm revealed somehow the surface of his shield? What was it that we never caught? What was he and what was he not? How much it was of him we met we cannot ever know, nor yet shall all he gave us quite atone for what was his and his alone. Nor need we now, since he knew best, nourish an ethical unrest. Rarely at once will nature give the power to be flamond and live. We cannot know how much we learn from those who never will return until a flash of unforeseen remembrance falls on what has been. We've each a darkening hill to climb, and this is why from time to time in Tilbury Town we look beyond horizons for the man Flamand. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Flower's Way by George W. Conan Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson I have stood long in the night under a star. I have stood still with shadowy head and arrowy leaves outspread under its trembling light where green things are. I have crept close to the grass where the beetles dart and the hummingbird and the dragonfly were visions in the sky and the mendicant bees that pass rifled my heart. I have lain long in the day under the sun, with my burning face in the arms of the wind, and my petals unconfined, and my virginal robes asway. Thus joy is won. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Forbearance of the Admiral by Wallace Irwin, read for LibriVox.org by M. Lee. I ain't afeard o' oh, the admiral 
though a common old tar I be, and I've often times spoke to the admiral, expressing a bright idee, for he's very nice at taking advice, and a tractable man is he. For once I says to the admiral, unterrified though polite, don't think me critical, admiral, but your vessel ain't sailing right, for our engine should be burning wood and our rattle lines should be tight. But when I spoke to the admiral, he wasn't inclined to scold, though me words addressed to the admiral was intimate like and bold, but he was up on deck at the time, and I was down in the hold. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ghost House by Robert Frost Read for LibriVox.org by Roger Smith Ghost House I dwell in a lonely house I know That vanished many a summer ago I left a trace but the cellar walls And a cellar in which the daylight falls And the purple stem wild raspberries grow O'er ruined fences the grapevine shield The woods came back to the mowing field the orchard tree has grown one copse of new wood and old where the woodpecker chops. The footpath down to the well is healed. I dwell with a strangely aching heart in that vanished abode there far apart, one that disused and forgotten road that has no dust bath now for the toad. Now comes the black bat's tumble and dart. The whippoorwill is coming to shout. The hush and cluck and flutter about. I hear him begin far enough away for many a time to say his say before he arrives to say it out. It is under the small dim summer star. I know not who these mute folk are who share the unlit place with me, who stones out under the low limb tree, doubtless bear names that the mosses mar. They are tireless folks, but slow and sad, though too close keeping our lass and lad. With none among them ever sings, and yet in view of many things, as sweet companions might be had. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Glow Worm by William Cooper Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug Beneath the hedge or near the stream A worm is known to stray That shows by night a lucid beam which disappears by day. Disputes have been, and still prevail, from whence his rays proceed. Some give that honour to his tail, and others to his head. But this is sure, the hand of might that kindles up the skies, gives him a modicum of light proportioned to his size. Perhaps indulgent nature meant by such a lamp bestowed, to bid the traveller, as he went, be careful where he trod, nor crush a worm whose useful light might serve, however small, to show a stumbling stone by night and save him from a fall. Whate'er she meant, this truth divine is legible and plain. Tis power almighty bids him shine, nor bids him shine in vain. Ye proud and wealthy, let this theme teach humbler thoughts to you, since such a reptile has its gem and boasts its splendour too. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Go, Lovely Rose by Edmund Waller Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp Go, lovely rose, tell her that wastes her time and me, that now she knows when I resemble her to thee how sweet and fair she seems to be. Tell her that's young and shuns to have her graces spied, that hadst thou sprung in deserts where no men abide, thou must have uncommended died. Small is the worth of beauty from the light retired, Bid her come forth, suffer herself to be desired, and not blush so to be admired. 
then die, that she the common fate of all things rare may read in thee. How small a part of time they share that are so wondrous, sweet, and fair. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Grandfather's Love by Sarah Teasdale. Read for Lyrabox.org by Twilight. August 2023. They said he sent his love to me. They wouldn't put it into my hand. And when I asked them where it was, they said I couldn't understand. I thought they must have hidden it. I hunted for it all the day. And when I told them so at night, they smiled and turned their heads away. They said that love is something kind that I can never see or touch. I wish he sent me something else. I like his cough drops twice as much. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Great Minimum by G. K. Chesterton. Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachok. It is something to have wept as we have wept. It is something to have done as we have done. It is something to have watched when all men slept and seen the stars which never see the sun. It is something to have smelt the mystic rose although it break and leave the thorny rods it is something to have hungered once as those must hunger who have ate the bread of gods to have seen you and your unforgotten face brave as a blast of trumpets for the fray pure as white lilies in a watery space it were something though you went from me to-day to have known the things that from the weak are furled, perilous ancient passions, strange and high. It is something to be wiser than the world. It is something to be older than the sky. In a time of skeptic moths and cynic rusts, and fatted lives that of their sweetness tire. In a world of flying loves and fading lusts, it is something to be sure of a desire. Lo, blessed are our ears, for they have heard. Yea, blessed are our eyes, for they have seen. Let thunder break on man and beast and bird and the lightning. It is something to have been. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Hollow Men by T. S. Eliot. Read for LibriVox.org by Dale Grothman. Mr. Kurtz, he dead. A penny for the old guy. One. We are the Hollow Men. We are the stuffed men, leaning together, headpiece filled with straw. Alas! Our dried voices, when we whisper together, are quiet and meaningless as the wind in dry grass, or rat's feet over broken glass in our dry cellar. Shape without form, shade without color, paralyzed force, gesture without motion. Those who have crossed with direct eyes to death's other kingdom remember us, if at all, not as lost violent souls but only as the hollow men, the stuffed men. 2. Eyes I dare not meet in dreams, in death's dream kingdom. These do not appear. There the eyes are sunlight on a broken column. There is a tree swinging, and voices are in the winds singing more distant and more solemn than a fading star let me be no nearer in death's dream kingdom 
let me also wear such deliberate disguises rat's coat crow skin crossed staves in a field behaving as the wind behaves no nearer not that final meeting in the twilight kingdom three this is the dead land this is cactus land here the stone images are raised here they receive the supplication of a dead man's hand under the twinkle of a fading star is it like this in death's other kingdom walking alone at the hour when we are trembling with tenderness lips that would kiss form prayers to broken stone four the eyes are not here there are no eyes here in this valley of dying stars in this hollow valley this broken jaw of our lost kingdoms in this last of meeting places we grope together and avoid speech gathered on this beach of this turmid river sightless unless the eyes reappear as the perpetual star multifoliate rose of death's twilight kingdom the hope only of empty men five here we go round the prickly pear prickly pear prickly pear here we go round the prickly pear at five o'clock in the morning between the idea and the reality between the motion and the act falls the shadow for thine is the kingdom between the conception and the creation between the emotion and the response lies the shadow life is very long between the desire and the spasm between the potency and the existence between the essence and the descent falls the shadow for thine is the kingdom for thine is life is for thine is the this is the way the world ends this is the way the world ends this is the way the world ends not with a bang but with a whimper end of poem this recording is in the public domain Home Thoughts from the Sea by Robert Browning Read for LibriVox.org by Roger Smith Home Thoughts from the Sea Nobly, nobly, Cape St. Vincent to the northwest died away. Sunset ran when glorious blood-red reckoning into Cadiz Bay. Bluish mid the burning water, full in face Trafalgar lay. In the dimmest northeast distant stone, Gibraltar, grand and gray. Here and here did England help me. How can I help England, say? Whoso turns as I this evening, turn to God and pray. While Jove's planet rises yonder, silent over Africa. End of point. This recording is in the public domain. I Hear America Singing by Walt Whitman Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp I hear America singing, the varied carols I hear, those of mechanics, each one singing his as it should be, blithe and strong, the carpenter singing his as he measures his plank or beam, the mason singing his as he makes ready for work, or leaves off work, the boatman singing what belongs to him in his boat, the deckhand singing on the steamboat deck, the shoemaker singing as he sits on his bench, the hatter singing as he stands, the woodcutter's song, the plowboy's on his way in the morning, or in the noon intermission, or at sundown, 
the delicious singing of the mother or of the young wife at work, or of the girl sewing or washing, each singing what belongs to her and to none else. The day what belongs to the day, at night the party of young fellows, robust, friendly, singing with open mouths their strong, melodious songs. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Learning to Go Alone by Jane Taylor and Ann Taylor. Read for LibriVox.org by Twilight, August 2023. Come, my darling, come away. Take a pretty walk today. Run along and never fear. I'll take care of baby dear. Up and down with little feet. That's the way to walk, my sweet. Now it's so very near. Soon she'll get the mother dear. There she comes out long at last. Here's my finger, hold it fast. Now one pretty little kiss after such a walk like this. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Madness by Rainer Maria Rilke. Read for LibriVox.org by Ahsanamet Mehdi. She thinks I am, have you not seen? Who are you then, Mary? I am a queen, I am a queen, to your knee, to your knee. And then she weeps, I was a child. Who are you then, Mary? Know you that I was no man's child, poor and in rags, said she. And then a princess I became, to whom men bend their knees. To princess things are not the same as those a beggar sees. And those things which have made you great come to you, tell me when. One night, one night, one night quite late, things became different then. I walked the lane which presently with strung cords seemed to bend. Then Mary became melody and danced from end to end. The people watched with startled mien, and passed with frightening glance, for all know that only a queen may dance in the lanes. Dance. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ode to Apollo by William Cooper Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug on an ink glass almost dried in the sun. Patron of all those luckless brains that, to the wrong side leaning, indite much metre with much pains and little or no meaning. Ah, why, since oceans, rivers, streams that water all the nations pay tribute to thy glorious beams in constant exhalations. Why, Stooping from the noon of day to covetous of drink, Apollo, hast thou stolen away a poet's drop of ink? Upborne in the viewless air, it floats a vapour now, impelled through regions dense and rare by all the winds that blow. Ordained, perhaps, ere summer flies, combined with millions more, to form an iris in the skies, though black and foul before illustrious drop and happy then beyond the happiest lot of all that ever passed my pen so soon to be forgot phoebus if such be thy design to place it in thy bow give wit that what is left may shine with equal grace below end of poem this recording is in the public domain On the Grasshopper by William Cooper Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug Happy songster perched above On the summit of the grove Whom a dewdrop cheers to sing With the freedom of a king From thy perch survey the fields Where prolific nature yields Nought that willingly is she Man surrenders not to thee 
for hostility or hate none thy pleasures can create thee it satisfies to sing sweetly the return of spring herald of the genial hours harming neither herbs nor flowers therefore man thy voice attends gladly thou and he are friends nor thy never-ceasing strains phoebus or the muse disdains as too simple or too long for themselves inspire the song earth-born bloodless undecaying ever singing sporting playing what has nature else to show godlike in his kind as thou end of poem this recording is in the public domain on the hurry of this time by austin dobson read for LibriVox.org by ike sure with slower pen men used to write of old when letters were polite in anna's or in george's days they could afford to turn a phrase or trim a struggling theme aright they knew not steam electric light not yet had dazed their karma sight they meted out both blame and praise with slower pen too swiftly now the hours take flight what's read at morn is dead at night scant space have we for art's delays whose breathless thought so briefly stays we may not work ah would we might with slower pen end of poem this recording is in the public domain Private Theatricals by Louise Imogen Guinea Read for LibriVox.org by Stunning in August 2023 You were a haughty beauty, Polly. That was in the play. I was the lover melancholy. That was in the play. And when your fan and you receded, and all my passion lay unheeded, if still with tenderer words I pleaded, that was in the play. I met my rival at the gateway, that was in the play. And so we fought a duel straightway, that was in the play. But when Jack hurt my arm unduly, and you rushed over, soft and newly, and kissed me, Polly, truly, truly, was that in the play? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Roses and Rue by Oscar Wilde Read for LibriVox.org by Ahsan Ahmed Mehdi in 8th August 2023 Could we dig up this long buried treasure where it worth a pleasure? We never could learn love song, we are parted too long. Could the passionate past that has fled call back its dead? Could we live it all over again while it were the pain? I remember we used to meet by an ivied seat, and you warbled each pretty word with the air of a bird, and your voice had a quaver in it just like a linnet, and shook as the blackbird's throat with its last big note. And your eyes, they were green and grey like an April day, but lit into amethyst when I stooped and kissed, and your mouth it would never smile for a long, long while. Then it rippled all over with laughter five minutes after. You were always afraid of a shower, just like a flower. I remember you started and ran when the rain began. I remember I never could catch you, for no one could match you. You had wonderful luminous fleet, little wings to your feet. I remember your hair, did I tie it? for it always ran red, like a tangled sunbeam of gold, these things are old. I remember so well the room and the lilac bloom, that beat as a dripping pain in the warm June rain, and the color of your gown, it was amber brown, and two yellow satin boughs from your shoulders rose, and the handkerchief of French lace, which you held to your face, had a small tear left a stain, or was it the rain? On your hand, as it waved at you, there was veins of blue, 
in your voice as it said goodbye was a petulant cry you have only wasted your life ah that was the knife when i rushed through the garden gate it was all too late could we live it all over again were it worth the pain could the passionate past that is fled call back its dead well if my heart must break dear love for your sake it will break in music i know poets hearts break so but strange that i was not told that the brain can hold in a tiny ivory cell god's heaven and hell end of poem this recording is in the public domain sinner's rule by a e hausman read for librivox.org by ronald gardella i walked alone and thinking and fate the night wind blew and stirred on mounds of crossways the flower of sinners rue where the roads part they bury him that his own hand slays and so the weed of sorrow springs at the four crossways by night i plucked its ulysses when morning broke tossed blue blew at my breast i fastened the flower of sinners rue it seemed a herb of healing a balsam and a sign flower of a heart whose trouble must have been worse than mine dead clay that did me kindness i can do none to you but only wear for breast knot the flower of sinners rue end of poem this recording is in the public domain song of nature by ralph waldo emerson read for LibriVox.org by ike Scher. mine are the night and morning the pits of air the gull of space the sportive sun the gibbous moon the innumerable days i hide in the solar glory i am dumb in the pealing song i rest on the pitch of the torrent in slumber i am strong no numbers have counted my tallies no tribes my house can fill i sit by the shining fount of life and pour the deluge still and ever by delicate powers gathering along the centuries from race on race the rarest flowers my wreath shall nothing miss and many a thousand summers my gardens ripened well and light from meliorating stars with firmer glory fell i wrote the past in characters of rock and fire the scroll the building in the coral sea the planting of the coal and thefts from satellites and rings and broken stars i drew and out of spent and aged things i formed the world anew what time the gods kept carnival tricked out in star and flower and in cramp elf and saurian forms they swathed their too much power time and thought were my surveyors they laid their course as well they boiled the sea and piled the layers of granite marl and shell but he the manchild glorious where tarries he the while the rainbow shines his harbinger the sunset gleams his smile my boreal lights leap upward forthright my planets roll and still the man-child is not born the summit of the whole must time and tide for ever run will never my winds go sleep in the west will never my wheels which whirl the sun and satellites have rest too much of donning and doffing too slow the rainbow fades I weary of my robe of snow, my leaves and my cascades. I tire of globes and races, too long the game is played. What without him is summer's pomp or winter's frozen shade? I travail in pain for him, my creatures travail and wait. His couriers come by squadrons. He comes not to the gate.
Twice have I moulded an image, and thrice outstretched my hand, made one of day and one of night, and one of the salt sea sand, one in a Judean manger, and one by Avon stream, one over against the mouths of Nile, and one in the Academe. I moulded kings and saviours and bards o'er kings to rule, but fell the starry influence short. The cup was never full. Yet whirl the glowing wheels once more, and mix the bowl again. Seethe fate, the ancient elements, heat, cold, wet, dry, and peace, and pain. Let war and trade and creeds and song blend, ripen race on race. The sunburnt world a man shall breed of all the zones and countless days. No ray is dimmed, no atom worn. My oldest force is good as new. And the fresh rose of yonder thorn gives back the bending heavens in dew. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Some Summer Days by Madison Cowine Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson 1. If you had seen her waiting there among the tiger lily blooms That sowed their jewels everywhere among the woodland gleams and glooms You had confessed her very fair and sweeter than the wood's perfumes A country girl with bare brown feet She waits while day slopes down the deeps the afternoon is dead with heat and all the weary shadows sleeps like toil arm pillowed in the wheat beside the scythe with which he reaps there is no sound more distant than the cowbell on the vine-hung hill no nearer than the locust span of noise that makes the silence shrill and now there comes a sun-browned man through dagger lilies of the rill long will they talk till in the end the clear west glows the east grows pale until the glow and pallor blend like moonlight on a shifting sail and then he'll clasp her she will bend her head consenting day will fail the west will flame then fade away through heavy orange rose and red and leave the heavens violet gray above a gypsy lily bed then they will go and he will say such words to her as none has said a million stars the night will win above them and one firefly pulse like a tangled starbeam in the cedar dark against the sky then he will lift her dimpled chin and take the kiss she'll not deny and when the moon like the great book of judgment golden with the light of god lies open o'er yon nook of darkest wood and wildest height together they will cross the brook and reach the gate and kiss good night two and now he wipes his hand along the beaded fire of his brow hard toiled has heated and the strong face flushes fuller health as now he fills his hay-fork to the prong and tossing it again doth bow and now he rests and looks away across the sun-fierce hills and meads and no rolling cloud has cooled it to-day and from his face the brawny beads drip and he marks the heaps of hay the fields of corn the fields of weeds at last he sees the tempest build black battlements along the west black breastworks that are thunder-filled and bares his brow and on his chest the sweat of toil is cooled and still the pulse of toil within his breast a strong wind brings the odorous death of far hay meadows and the scent is good within his nostrils breath the mighty trees are bowed that lent for no man as when power saith bow down and stalwart men are bent he laughs long gazing as he goes along the elder sweetened lane he feels the storm wind as it blows across the sheaves of golden grain 
and stopped to pull one bramble rose and watch the swiftly coming rain and there mid locust trees the farm dreams in a martin haunted place he marks the far-off streaks of storm that driven of the thunder race he sees his child upon her arm and in the door his wife's fair face three below the sunset's range of rose below the heaven's bending blue down woodways where the balsam blows and milkweed tufts hang gray of hue a jersey heifer stops and lows the cows come home by one by two there is no star yet but the smell of hay and pennyroyal mix with herb aromas of the dell and the root hidden cricket clicks among the iron weeds a bell clangs near the rail fenced clover ricks she waits upon the slope beside the windless well the plum tree shade the well curb that the goose plums hide her light hand on the bucket laid unbonneted as she waits glad-eyed her dress as simple as her braid she sees fawn-colored backs among the sumacs now a tossing horn a clashing bell of brass that rung long shadows lean upon the corn and all the day dies scarlet stung the cloud in it a rosy thorn below the pleasant moon that tips the tree-tops of the hillside fly the evening bats the twilight slips some fireflies like spangles by she meets him and their happy lips touch and one star leaps in the sky he takes her bucket and they speak of married hopes while in the grass the plum lies glowing as her cheek the patient cows look back or pass and in the west one golden streak burns like a great cathedral glass four the skies are amber blue and green before the coming of the sun and all the deep hills sleep serene as if enchanted every one is ribbed with morning mists that lean on woods through which vague whispers run birds wake and on the vine-hung knobs above the brook a twittering confuses songs one warbler robs another of its note a wing beats by and now a wild throat throbs triumphant all the woodlands sing the sun is up the hills are heaped with instant splendor and the vales surprised with shimmers that are steeped in purple where the thin mist trails the waterfall the rock it leaped are burning gold that foams and fails he drives his horses to the plough along the vineyard slopes where bask dewy heavy grapes half ripen now in sunshot shafts of shade no mask of joy he wears his face and brow glow as he enters on his task before him soaring through the mist the gray hawk wildly wings and screams its dewy back gleams sunbeam kissed above the wood that drips and dreams he guides the plough with one strong fist the soil rolls back in level seams packed to the right the sassafras lifts leafy walls of spice that shade the blackberries whose tendrils mass big berries in the coolness made and drop their ripeness on the grass where trumpet flowers fall and fade white on the left the fence and trees that mark the garden and the smoke uncurling in the early breeze tells of the roof beneath the oak he turns his team and turning sees the damp dark soil his coulter broke bees hum and o'er the berries poise lean-bodied wasps loud blackbirds turn following the plough there is a noise of insect wings that buzz and burn and now he hears his wife's low voice the song she sings to help her turn five there are no clouds that drift around the moon's pearl kindled crystal white as some sky summoned spirit wound in raiment lit with limbs of light that have not softened like the sound of harps when heaven forgets to smite the veils are deeper than the dark and darker than the veils the woods that shadowy hill and meadow mark with broad blurred lines where over broods deep calm and now a fox hounds bark upon the quietude intrudes and though the night is never still yet what we name its noises makes its silence now a whippoorwill a frog whose hoarser tremor breaks the hush then insect sounds that fill the night 
an owl that hoots and wakes they lean against the gate that leads into the lane that lies between the yard and orchard flowers and weeds smell sweeter than the odors keen that day distills from hotness beads of dew make cool the gray and green their infant sleeps they feel the peace of something done that god has blessed still as the pulse that will not cease there in the cloud that lights the west the peace of love that shall increase while soul to soul still gives its best in the poem this recording is in the public domain excerpt from the prelude book four summer vacation by william wordsworth read for librivox dot org by winston tharp when from our better selves we have too long been parted by the hurrying world and droop sick of its business of its pleasures tired how gracious how benign is solitude how potent a mere image of her sway most potent when impressed upon the mind with an appropriate human centre hermit deep in the bosom of the wilderness votary and vast cathedral where no foot is treading where no other face is seen kneeling at prayers or watchman on the top of lighthouse beaten by atlantic waves or as the soul of that great power is met sometimes embodied on a public road when for the night deserted it assumes a character of quiet more profound than pathless wastes End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Through a Window Glass by Josephine Pinckney. Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist. One Looking In. The passer by who happens to lift his eyes to three long windows fronting the green sea is pricked by the oblique hawk gaze of three women with glittering needles that fall and rise the shadowy room behind them magnifies their forms like fates that sit eternally beside a pool's dark margin they decree an icy blight upon the one who pries the footsteps of the passer-by are hurried by these grim women and inimical he calls them witches and resents the fear of arrogant glances that had got him flurried walking along the water people all speak evil of the trio sewing there two looking out between brocaded curtains they discern distasteful faces weaving to and fro their carved chair backs in a forbidding row impanel a conclave absolute and stern they read no vulgate and their candles burn to other than demos when the long ships blow steaming for ocean they are not drawn they know steam shrills no siren tone they want to learn tides of new people froth about the feet of three inhospitable to the strange tall panes of glass wall out the common street wall in ancestral echoes bewailing change they keep their glances poised to paralyze the passer-by who happens to lift his eyes end of poem this recording is in the public domain under the similitude of a captive songbird by thomas crashaw read for LibriVox.org by public domain scholar under the similitude of a captive songbird the time of the singing of birds is come. I will away in the greenwood to roam. I will away, and thou azure-eyed muse, 
deign with thy gifts my mind to suffuse so overheard i one say as he withdrew to a fairy scene that i well knew light laced with shadow shadow with light leaves playing bow peep from morn unto night but ah what is this alas and alas a sweet bird flutters upon the grass flutters and struggles with quivering wing tempted and snared gentle guileless thing vain vain thy struggles for lo a hand hallowed above what makes thee captive stand ho oh, hides the captor loud singing his joy he has got a pet songbird for his boy now twinning and twisting a cage he makes wire wrought and fastened ah my heart aches it is a prison for the poor bird prepared shut close and netted netted and barred comes the flutter and gleam of forest leaves through the trestlet window under the eaves comes the breath and stir of the vernal wind comes the golden sunshine to remind of all that is lost comes now and again far off a song from the blading green calling still calling a songster to come back once more back to its woodland home i mark eyelids rise mark the lifting wing mark the swelling throat as if it would sing mark the weary chirp chirp like infants cry yearning after the free and boundless sky for the grand old woods once more to sit on the swinging bough and to blossom smith vain vain poor bird thou art captive still thou must bend thee to thy captor's will thy wing is cut from thy mate thou art taken all alone thou abidest sad forsaken the days pass on and i look in once more on the captive songbird above the ivy door sweetly it sings as if all by itself a short quiet song o thou silly elf hast forgotten the green wood the forest hoar the flash of the sky the wind's softened roar hast forgotten that thou still a captive art prison and wire work hast forgot thy smart tis even so for now down and now up now hopping on a perch now sipping from cup i mark it sullen and pining no more but keeping within though open the door list ye now list from its swelling throat of its woodland song you miss never a note alone it is true and in the wired cage but kindness has melted the captive's rage behold the sweet meaning in this bird's story how the child of god is ripened for glory for it is thus with the child of god smitten and bleeding neath his rod thus tis with him for tranquil and calm mid dangers and insults he singeth his psalm alone all alone deserted of man slandered and trampled and placed under ban he frets not he pines not he plains not still but sees clear in all his dear father's will come lost come cross come bereavement come wrong he sets all to music turns all to song come terror come trial come dark day come bright still upward he looks and knows all is right wounded he sees the hand gives the stroke bending his neck to bear his lord's yoke he finds it grow light by grace from above as love's slender collars oh the queen of love comes a starting tear tis dried with a smile comes a cloud as you look tis gone the while he stirs the old adam to tempt and to dare he thinks who was tempted and knows what we are gentle and meek murmurs not nor rebels but serene as in heaven and tranquil dwells as so the believer has songs in the night as so every cloud has a lining of light thus even thus the captive bird's story tells how a soul is ripened for glory end of poem this recording is in the public domain